happen. So maybe I'll just go ahead and introduce Prof. John Chan's uh, Prof. John Chan to begin his talk. So Professor Dr. John Chan Kaming is a consultant cardiothoracic surgeon and the head of cardiothoracic surgery at the Cardiac Vascular Central Kuala Lumpur. He has a large clinical practice in the full range of adult cardiac and thoracic surgery, including cabbage, aortic surgery, aortic valve, mitral and tricuspid surgery, and AF ablation surgery, amongst others. He has performed more than 1,200 cardiac and thoracic surgical operations with an overall survival of more than 99%. He has a special interest in mitral and tricuspid valve repair surgery and repairs almost all degenerative and functional mitral and tricuspid regurgitation cases referred to him. Prof. John, you may proceed. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Diva, for that nice introduction. Uh, I hope you all can hear me. And uh, thank you to Edwards for organizing this uh, session today. Uh, I hope that uh, it's useful to, to everyone. So I'm told that uh, we have uh, it's mainly surgeons here, and uh, uh, so I will focus a bit on the uh, the surgical parts, but at the same time give some introduction as well on the subject of tricuspid uh, valve surgery. Uh, just let me find my slides. Okay, I think. Uh, I think you can see my slides. Yes. So, um, so as a reminder on the anatomy of the tricuspid valve, as we know, it has three leaflets, the septal leaflet, the anterior leaflet, and the posterior leaflet. And the uh, anterior leaflet is the largest of these leaflets. The septal leaflet is typically retracted downwards and typically it's a small leaflet. And these leaflets are attached to the uh, tricuspid annulus. It's part of the uh, fibrous skeleton of the heart. Uh, important to remember the, the relations of the tricuspid valve during uh, surgery when we're doing an annuloplasty. And remember particularly that the right coronary artery runs along here, so it's near the uh, posterior annulus of the tricuspid valve. So in this area, we have to be careful in the placement of sutures that they should not be uh, placed too deep. Uh, otherwise, we may catch the right coronary artery, particularly if the tricuspid annulus is very dilated. Uh, even if we do not catch the right coronary with sutures, uh, there is a risk of distorting the uh, right coronary and that can cause problems. So uh, care is taken uh, in that area. And the other areas, of course, in this area of the uh, anterior leaflet, because the aortic valve and the aorta is just behind it. Uh, this is the area, the, the septal annulus is the area where we typically have to uh, we, we, we are quite safe to put sutures a little bit deeper because this is where the anchoring point of the um, of the ring will be, the tricuspid ring. Uh, but bear in mind that the atrioventricular node is just here. But fortunately, uh, most of the rings, uh, all of the tricuspid rings nowadays have a gap in this area so that we, have, we are quite safe in the placement of sutures. We won't uh, catch that uh, area. But if we're doing a tricuspid valve replacement, uh, then we have to be uh, careful in this area. And in this area, uh, probably it's better to, to place the sutures actually on the leaflets, uh, through the leaflet rather than through the annulus so that we uh, do not uh, put the patient into a complete heart block. So a reminder here of, of the relations uh, and where the conduction tissue is at the apex of the triangle of cork. This is the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve, valve the coronary sinus, and the uh, tendon of Todaro here. Now, the tricuspid valve, just like the mitral valve, is the free edge of the tricuspid valve leaflet is attached to chordae tendine, which is then attached to pap papillary muscles. 
But in the case of the uh, septal leaflet, you can see here that some of the chordae tendini attach directly onto the septum and to the uh, right ventricle. And um, in the tricuspid valve in particular, there are two large papillary muscles, typically in this position, which supports the anterior leaflet and part of the posterior leaflet. And so to size the uh, tricuspid valve, typically we, we would retract or pull on these two papillary muscles so that these two leaflets are then straightened out and we can use the size of this leaflet as a, a means to determine the size of the tricuspid annuloplasty ring. So the etiology of tricuspid regurgitation most commonly in the developed countries and in the cities is functional, but in the developing countries and in the more rural parts of the developing countries, including in Malaysia, we do see rheumatic, mitra, uh, rheumatic tricuspid regurgitation. And of course, there is a, a small number of degenerative endocarditis, iatrogenic due, due to pacemaker leads, trauma, tumor, and other congenital lesions. Uh, I will focus more on the functional uh, etiology of tricuspid regurgitation because that is the most common, uh, but perhaps also touch a bit on the rheumatic because that is fairly common in uh, parts of Asia. So the most common cause of tricuspid valve dysfunction is functional tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, if we look at the overall population, it is not that common less than 1%. But if we look at patients with heart failure, uh, it is fairly common up to one third of patients with heart failure have some degree of tricuspid regurgitation. And particularly in patients with mitral regurgitation, up to half of them will have some degree of tricuspid regurgitation. So I think uh, Si Hoi uh, has mentioned this, that tricuspid regurgitation is not a benign condition because uh, the presence of moderate or more tricuspid regurgitation has an impact on survival. And this seems to be the case even when uh, things like PA pressures, LV and RV size and function are corrected for. It, is, it has been shown to be an independent uh, predictor of reduced survival. Uh, this was published this year in the European, uh, in the European Heart Journal uh, and it this show that even after mitral valve surgery, if you have uh, residual tricuspid regurgitation, either moderate or severe, these patients uh, do not live as long as compared to patients who do not have tricuspid valve, tricuspid regurgitation after mitral valve surgery. And when they look at this a bit more closely and adjusted for various compounding factors, uh, the presence of tricuspid regurgitation again was an independent predictor of reduced survival in, in the long term. So uh, the pathophysiology of functional TR, I, I, I think Dr. C. Hoy, U. C. Hoy has gone through this, so I won't uh, repeat this again. Uh, but important to appreciate that one of the reasons, uh, one of the things we have to appreciate in tricuspid regurgitation is the fact that the right ventricle is a very compliant structure, more so compared to the left ventricle. So if you look at these pressure volume studies, if we uh, increase the, the pressure in the right ventricle, the right ventricle will just increase in volume, meaning it will just dilate up. And this is a reason why uh, tricuspid regurgitation severity is variable and it depends on the preload, afterload, and RV contractility. And this is an example of a patient, and you can see that the, the same patient, that the TR severity uh, varies. It was uh, only very trivial a month before surgery, and then it increased a bit to moderate the day before surgery and intraoperatively. Uh, it was only trivial again because, of course, during surgery, the patient is fully, uh, the afterload is uh, uh, completely reduced with the general anesthetic. So, uh, illustrating the fact that uh, you may get different measurements of TR severity depending on the 
loading conditions of the patient and depending on when you do the uh, echocardiography. And so some other means to uh, determine the need for tricuspid valve intervention is, is important. And some years ago, uh, I was privileged to work with Jill Dreyfus at Harefield, and uh, we first proposed this tricuspid annual dilatation as one of the factors, one of the parameters we can measure to help guide the need for surgery. And at that time, uh, because we didn't no, the concept of tricuspid dilatation wasn't there, but what we did was we proposed two fixed points at surgery which we can easily measure, and that is the enteroceptor commissure and the anteroposterior commissure. And we proposed that if it was bigger than 70 millimeters, then it was considered to be dilated, and all of these patients then had a tricuspid valve repair. Uh, as Dr. C. Hoy has uh, pointed out, this measurement is different from that measured by echocardiography, which essentially measures uh, the middle around the, the septal annulus to the anterior annulus. But roughly speaking, a uh, measurement of 40 millimeters by echocardiography corresponds to a measure of 70 millimeters uh, measured surgically. And this finding has been corroborated in uh, studies which show that if the tricuspid annulus annular diameter exceeds 40 millimeters as measured by echocardiography, the volume of tricuspid regurgitation does uh, increase significantly. So this is an example of a dilated tricuspid annulus. Uh, you can see that this is a 34 uh, ring, 34 carpentia. In this case, this is a classic ring. And uh, you can see how dilated this annulus is, more than 70 millimeters and how much, uh, how much reduction in the size of the tricuspid annulus would result if we were to suture uh, that to the, the tricuspid ring. Uh, so you can see that um, uh, uh, we, would, we actually reduce the tricuspid annulus quite significantly in a lot of patients. Uh, in this group of patients particularly, we have to be careful when we place the sutures in this area because this is where the right coronary artery runs. And we have to be, uh, so in this area, don't place the sutures too deeply. Uh, we are quite safe in this area and we're quite safe in the, the septal area here. Uh, one precaution we can do is when we place sutures in the tricuspid annulus in this area, just uh, pull on those sutures a bit and then you can see the, the right coronary artery on the surface of the heart here and just make sure that it is not uh, distorting the right coronary artery. If you do notice that it is distorting the right coronary artery, then just remove the sutures and place it again. So that is something you can do, particularly for this really big annulus uh, uh, when you do a reduction annulo annuloplasty. And this is again how we measure the tricuspid annulus intraoperatively. Uh, nowadays, we rarely uh, measure the tricuspid annulus intraoperatively because we have now gone to measuring it by echocardiography. So nowadays we determine the need to intervene on the tricuspid valve preoperatively rather than intraoperatively. And by echocardiographic measurements, uh, we should be able to decide before the surgery whether an intervention is needed on the tricuspid valve uh, or not. And as you can see in this study, the uh, the part of the annulus which is dilated is mainly the anterior and posterior annulus, not so much the tricuspid, not, not so much the septal annulus, although some dilatation of the septal annulus uh, can develop as well. Another thing to appreciate is, of course, the tricuspid annulus is uh, not a flat structure, it is like a waveform uh, structure, but this waveform uh, geometry of the tricuspid valve is lost in patients with moderate or more tricuspid regurgitation, as we can see here. So uh, that is why the newer design rings have tried to uh, re reshape the tricuspid rings to recreate this uh, waveform uh, geometry uh, in tricuspid annuloplasty. And another thing to appreciate is that it is not just tricuspid uh, dilatation which causes 
uh, tricuspic regurgitation, but the geometry of the right ventricle also has an impact on the development of tricuspic regurgitation that the RV eccentricity uh, uh, index uh, does uh, determine as well the degree of tricuspic regurgitation, and that is just this measurement of C over, over D. So determinants of functional TR, tricuspic anodimeter, diameter, if it's more than 40 millimeters, or uh, the tethering area greater than one centimeter, or an RV eccentricity index of greater than two have been shown to be uh, determinants of functional uh, TR. Um, so this, this is Jill Dreyfus, and I think probably everything I would mention in this uh, presentation today was taught to me by, by Jill. He really got us thinking about uh, the concept of tricuspid annular dilatation, and then subsequently on tricuspid leaflet tethering, and proposed uh, various techniques to prepare the tricuspid valve, uh, which I will uh, hope to share with you today. So this is the paper which first got us thinking about tricuspid annular dilatation. Uh, it's not a very strong paper, but it is the first of many papers which really got us to think about the concept of tricuspid annular dilatation. And this was way back in 2005, so 15 years ago. And at that time, what we did was we, uh, in every patient coming for mitral valve repair, we would open up the right atrium and measure the tricuspid annular diameter size. And we determined that it was greater than 70 millimeters in half of the patients. Of course, this depended very much on the stage at, at which the patient would come for surgery. Uh, in the UK in 2005, typically patients uh, uh, did not come for surgery when they were asymptomatic. So these were typically patients who uh, were symptomatic uh, and before they came for surgery. And we can see that um, in those who had uh, a tricuspid annular diameter above uh, 70 millimeter, all of them had the tricuspid valve repaired. But in those who did not have tricuspid annular dilatation, then uh, the tricuspid valve was left alone. Now, when we did a tricuspid valve repair in these patients, it did not have an impact on mortality. You can see the operative mortality was the same or similar. But at late follow-up, you can see that those who had the tricuspid valve repair uh, had a better NMHA functional class. So they were better symptomatically. And importantly, the uh, TR grade in those whom we did not do the repair seemed to progress to moderate over five years in half of the patients. So this suggests to us that uh, perhaps 70 millimeters was uh, uh, too high a threshold, in fact, because in these patients, um, the, they had progression of the TR grade when the diameter was less than 70 millimeters. So the threshold for intervention of tricuspid or the tricuspid valve was probably less than 70 millimeters, although we used 70 millimeters uh, in those days. So in those who just had the mitral valve repair without tricuspid regurgitation, you can see most of them uh, did not a significant TR, but at late at five years, a significant number of them developed progression of the uh, TR severity. And this is just comparing the two groups: uh, group one who had just the mitral valve surgery, and group two who had mitral valve surgery plus the tricuspid valve repair. And at late follow-up, those who had the tricuspid valve repair uh, did not have much TR, whereas those who just had the mitral valve surgery had a uh, progression of the TR severity. Uh, so since that publication, numerous other studies have reported the same thing. Uh, and this is one from Kim et al. Uh, following mitral valve replacement for rheumatic mitral valve disease. And you can see that uh, in those who had the tricuspid valve repair, there was freedom from significant TR. But in those who did not have the uh, tricuspid valve repair, a significant proportion of them develop significant TR over the next five to 10 years. And the risk factors for, for TR progression was tricuspid annular dilatation, pulmonary hypertension, and the presence of atrial fibrillation. And importantly, that 
post-operative moderate severe TR was an independent predictor of poorer event-free survival. And this is another paper from Navia showing that uh, proportion of patients who had no tricuspid valve intervention had a progression of the uh, TR grade in, in the subsequent years. Uh, this is from the Mayo Clinic from UMass, again showing the same thing. After surgery, uh, mitral valve surgery, the mean TR grade was 1.7, and this had progressed to 2 uh, by 5 years uh, without tricuspid valve intervention. Uh, and this is Tyrone David's uh, study showing that there was a progression of the TR after mitral valve repair in about 20% uh, of their patients. Uh, and in those, and this same study showed that those who had TR progression were those who did not have a tricuspid valve annuloplasty, whereas those who had a tricuspid valve annuloplasty did not have a progression of their TR. Uh, interestingly, this study showed that of those who had progression of their tricuspid regurgitation, it was not because they then developed a recurrence of their mitral regurgitation. As you can see here, they had isolated TR progression without the MR progression. So the, the patients who developed TR after mitral valve surgery, they did not have uh, uh, more mitral regurgitation, but it was just that their tricuspid regurgitation progressed with time. Of course, this can be due to the fact that uh, the assessment of tricuspid regurgitation may have improved over the, the years and that we are better at picking up tricuspid regurgitation now than at the time of the initial surgery. But I think it does point to the uh, importance of looking closely at the tricuspid valve and not ignoring it uh, if there is uh, tricuspid valve pathology at the time of mitral valve surgery. And again, another study uh, by Song et al. showing again that patients with 2 plus TR, a proportion will progress to 3 to 4 plus uh, if it is not addressed. Um, and importantly, uh, this is one of several papers showing that the presence of tricuspid regurgitation in the long term after mitral valve surgery has an impact on survival. And patients who have tricuspid regurgitation after mitral valve surgery do not live as long as compared to patients who do not have tricuspid regurgitation after mitral valve surgery. And this is another patient by another study by Quack et al. Uh, reporting again a progression of TR in 27% of patients and again showing that this appears to have an impact on the uh, uh, long-term survivor. And the other important thing to appreciate is that if we were uh, to leave the tricuspid valve alone and then intervene at the later stage on the tricuspid valve after mitral valve surgery, uh, these patients don't do as well. You can see the one-year survivor is down to about 60 to 70 percent uh, after a re-operation on the tricuspid valve in patients who have had a previous mitral valve surgery without a tricuspid valve intervention. So uh, this does tell us that it is better to uh, address the tricuspid valve uh, the first time during the initial mitral valve surgery rather than to wait until the tri patient has severe TR uh, years after mitral valve surgery and then think of intervention at that stage because the survivor then just uh, the risk of surgery is then very high and the outcome for the patient is also not that good at that stage. So these are the guidelines from the ESC. Um, obviously, we know that if there is severe TR, then they need uh, tricuspid valve surgery. Uh, but if they have uh, mild or moderate TR, but if this is associated with tricuspid annular dilatation or uh, raised PA pressures, then uh, tricuspid valve surgery is uh, indicated in those patients. Uh, so this is an example. This is a patient with rheumatic mitral regurgitation and also aortic regurgitation, uh, severe AR, severe MR. So the clearly needs aortic and mitral valve surgery, but the tricuspid valve was also uh, showing mild to moderate TR. But in this case, you can see here the tricuspid annular diameter measured uh, 48 millimeters. So um, nowadays with all the studies, I think most of us will intervene on the uh, tricuspid valve. Of course, we can repair by ring annuloplasty 
or we can repair by suture and neuroplasty or by other means. And I think uh, uh, various techniques are, are there to repair the tricuspid valve. In this case, uh, an, 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 a tricuspid aneuroplasty ring was used. This is the uh, MC3 ring, the tricuspid and MC3 ring. Uh, and the patient had a very good uh, outcome from this. So there are various ways to as assess the tricuspid valve. Uh, I just do an oblique uh, atriotomy from the uh, along this direction. Uh, I typically put in um, two venous cannula. I connect the IVC, the SVC directly, and the uh, IVC uh, through the lower part of the right atrium. Uh, I think if you're doing tricuspid valve surgery, it's easier to cannulate it this way rather than try to cannulate the. Uh, SVC through the right atrium. You can also do that, but I think uh, by, by cannulating the SVC directly, I think it uh, it gives you greater access to the tricuspid valve. So I, I do this in all operations on the mitral valve, and if need if I need to get to the tricuspid valve, then obviously we need some snuggers, some tapes around the SVC and IVC as well. And uh, typically, uh, you could either use retractors or you could place some sutures on the to hold the right atrium open, and uh, you can see the tricuspid valve very well. Uh, sizing of the tricuspid endless, as I've described before, the the ring sizes also come with some notches at the bottom, and you can use that to size the septal leaflet and and use that as a guide for the. Uh, the, the tricuspid ring which is needed. Typically nowadays I would undersize the tricuspid lead, the tricuspid annulus. So if I measure it as a as a 30 millimeter ring, I would typically use a 28 millimeter ring uh, to increase the co-optation between the, the leaflets. Uh, and I, I sometimes use the, the size of the ring I put into the for the mitral valve as a as a guide to to what size ring I use for the, the tricuspid valve as well. So if I put in a 28 millimeter ring in the mitral valve, uh, very often the tricuspid valve, I would I would use the same size ring. Uh, but you can size it objectively by, by, by this technique. Uh, doing a ring annuloplasty uh, is, um, uh, it, I think it's quite important that we do not distort the, the tricuspid annulus during annuloplasty. So um, obviously place all the sutures around the tricuspid from round about the middle of the septal annulus all the way around right up to the uh, anterior annulus. And then uh, the rings, the tricuspid ring uh, come with some markings on it already as a guide. So uh, one good way to do it is to place the, the first stitch here first through the ring and then place the, um, the annuloplasty ring, the um, commissure suture through the ring as well to the corresponding place. And then the commissure suture here as well through the ring. Uh, so that you, you, so these are the, the points where the, the, the uh, where you want to uh, position the, the annuloplasty suture so that you do not distort the ring. So it's a good guide to place the commissure sutures to the corresponding uh, positions in the annuloplasty ring. And then after that, you could then space out the other sutures uh, accordingly. So uh, water the sutures and then gentle traction of the sutures when you push down on the ring. Uh, typically, if you place the sutures around on the tricuspid unless it can be quite, uh, should be quite strong. But uh, in some parts uh, of the suture, um, some parts of the tricuspid annulus, if you're not place, place it through the annuloplasty ring, uh, it may not be too strong a tissue. So, so I think some some care has to be taken when you're lower, lowering down the ring onto the and onto the tricuspid annulus, that uh, you're actually pushing on the ring rather than pulling on the the annulus. And uh, closure of the atri atriotomy is quite uh, routine. Uh, I, I now this use a double layer rather than single layer, um, just so that I, I avoid the need to put additional sutures at the end. 
uh, and I use a, a 4 o proline uh, typically. So uh, I mentioned the classic ring. This, this was the first, the initial sort of ring uh, which I use, but I, I don't think it's in production anymore, the classic ring. Uh, it is a, a good ring, but it is a little bit uh, rigid. And then um, the MC3 ring replaced it, and it has got um, this waveform geometry con configuration. So it's not a flat ring. It, it, it uh, helps to restore the tricuspid endless to the to this uh, waveform geometry. And then more recently, there is the physio ring. The, the physio ring is also a three, 3D ring, and it has the advantage Avant, uh, the advantage that it is, it has some flexibility in this direction here. So there is some movement, and this this uh, movement helps to take off the tension on the uh, annuloplasty ring, uh, because if you have a rigid ring, uh, you can imagine the tension on the um, annulus will be higher compared to uh, if you have a, a semi-rigid ring. So the physio tricuspid ring has that uh, uh, semi-flexibility and, and this has allowed, allowed the ring to be a bit shorter in length along the septal part of the leaflet. If you compare the, uh, the length of the septal part of the ring in the physio ring compared to the classic ring, you'll find that it is a lot shorter. Uh, and obviously, this will then uh, make it less likely that you place sutures through the uh, conduction tissues. Uh, and at the same time, because of the flexibility, uh, it has allowed, allowed um, the length of that to be shortened without uh, a risk of, uh, of, of uh, dehiscence. So the, the, the strength is still there because the flexibility has allowed uh, a smaller ring uh, to, be, to be used. So this Alan Carpentier, he is responsible for developing the the uh, the annuloplasty rings for uh, the tricuspid valve and also the mitral valve, and I think he has probably uh, uh, it can be considered the uh, the father of mitral and uh, tricuspid valve uh, surgery, and it has um, contributed greatly to our understanding of this of tricuspid valve disease and also how to uh, how to repair tricuspid valves there are of course other ways to re uh, repair the tricuspid valve uh, for example using the ring annuloplasty this is the divega the classic divega uh, annuloplasty where uh, a 2o suture pledged 2 is just run along the uh, the tricuspid annulus and then tightened to reduce the size. And there are modifications of this. Uh, this is from Antunis, where individual pledgeted sutures are placed. Uh, and then this is a further uh, modification uh, of the, the Vega annuloplasty, where the uh, annulus is reduced in size uh, until the water test reveals there's no tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, and then this is yet another technique of uh, suture annuloplasty. This is a technique which I have used and uh, which was taught to me by Prakash Punjabi. He's a surgeon at the Hammersmith Hospital in London. Uh, and uh, we just place interrupted 2O uh, antibond sutures along the, uh, initially along the posterior annulus of the tricuspid valve. And then uh, and then we can extend this all the way across the anterior annulus as well. And how many of these plication switches is placed depends on whether there's any TR on the on the water test. So this is another uh, technique to uh, to uh, repair the tricuspid valve with sutures. And this is another technique, the clover technique, uh, where where you just uh, obliterate the posterior annulus with with sutures. Uh, and but there are a lot of studies comparing suture annuloplasty and ring annuloplasty, and it does appear that um, the the ring annuloplasty has a better durability uh, in terms of a, re a reduced incidence of recurrent tricuspid regurgitation in the long term. Uh, if you compare uh, ring annuloplasty compared with the De Vega uh, annuloplasty technique. And this is another study from McCarthy 
uh, again showing that uh, if you use the either a rigid ring uh, that, that has a lower uh, recurrence rate of 3 or 4 plus TR compared to the Vega uh, annuloplasty. But even then, you can see that even with uh, the use of a, a rigid ring, that uh, there is about a 15% uh, recurrence rate of tricuspid regurgitation in the long term. So uh, there are some patients, there are a group of patients who clearly uh, who, who clearly uh, may need something additional besides a tricuspid annuloplasty because with, even with a tricuspid annuloplasty, there is a recurrence rate of tricuspid regurgitation. And in this particular study, they identified risk factors as of recurrent TR as being those with a higher pre-op TR, poorer LV function, a permanent pacemaker, or repair other than a ring annuloplasty. Uh, similarly, this is another study by uh, Michael Borger, again showing that the uh, ring annuloplasty had the better long-term survivor and freedom from recurrent TR compared to uh, no uh, suture annuloplasty. So uh, further studies have shown that the predictors of recurrent TR after tricuspid valve annuloplasty appears to be uh, leaflet tethering, that if you have a significant leaflet tethering, uh, tethering area of more than 0.8 or leaf tethering height of more than 0.5, that does seem to be a predictor of recurrent TR. And this is another study which shows that tenting volume uh, was a predictor of recurrent tricuspid regurgitation. So Dr. E.O.C. Hoy has mentioned this, the that measuring the tethering height, now this we consider tethering up of above eight millimeters as being uh, something to be uh, uh, careful about and something to consider additional repair techniques besides the uh, annuloplasty if the tethering height is greater than eight millimeters because of the studies which show that there is a, a risk that of recurrent TR in this group of patients. So, uh, this, so this is an example in this publication by Tupiusi. It's demonstrated that there are two groups. There, there are a few groups of patients, but this just demonstrates that in this patient here, there is clearly tricuspid annular dilatation without leaflet tethering, whereas in this group of patients, there is a significant leaflet tethering. You can see the co-optation point of the leaflets is way above the plane of the tricuspid annulus, whereas in this patient here, the co-optation point is almost at the plane of the tricuspid annulus. Now, you can have uh, patients with tricuspid leaflet tethering without tricuspid annular dilatation. Of course, you can have patients with tricuspid annular dilatation and tricuspid leaflet tethering uh, in one group of patients. Most of, the, most of the patients do have tricuspid annular dilatation and tricuspid leaflet tethering. But uh, we are seeing patients also in whom uh, there is significant leaflet tethering, but not tricuspid annular dilatation. So the two uh, pathologies uh, can be uh, separate from each other, or they can be part of the same disease process in, in the patient. And obviously, if you have a patient with uh, tricuspid leaflet tethering, severe tethering, without annular dilatation, then uh, doing a uh, undersized tricuspid annuloplasty is going to be of limited uh, benefit in the long term in terms of reducing the TR because the tricuspid annulus was not dilated to start with. But if you have both tricuspid annular dilatation and leaflet tethering, then probably uh, if you do an, an annuloplasty, then at least you, you will address the, the annular dilatation and you can improve the TR grade, but but you have the risk of recurrence uh, tricuspid regurgitation uh, in the longer term. Uh, so this is a recent publication where they have demonstrated the different phases of tricuspid regurgitation from just annular dilatation to annular dilatation with some tethering to annular dilatation with significant tethering of the valve leaflets uh, uh, along with uh, distortion and dilatation of the right ventricle. So this is an example of a patient you see with severely tethered leaflets. You can see here uh, there's no co-optation and the 
theoretical point of coordination is way into the right ventricle. And not surprisingly, this patient had a very severe tricuspid regurgitation, almost free TR. Uh, and this is uh, again measured by uh, transesophageal echocardi echocardiography. So again, we have a few options on how to address the tricuspid valve in this uh, patient. Uh, in this group of patients, I think it's quite safe to say that suture and aneuplasty uh, would not be suitable. I mean, you could consider consider suture aneuplasty if there's only mild dilatation of the tricuspid annulus. But with, with this degree of a severe uh, tricuspid regurgitation, at the very least, the, uh, the patient would need a ring aneuplasty and probably additional uh, repair techniques or perhaps even considering replacing the tricuspid valve in this group of patients. Uh, so some years ago, Jill Dreyfus um, described this technique of uh, tricuspid leaflet augmentation. And um, essentially, uh, it follows the same principles as mitral leaflet augmentation, which uh, is more widely performed. Uh, and um, we chose to augment the anterior leaflet, uh, even though in many cases it is the septal leaflet which is tattered. And that is because the septal leaflet is usually a very retracted and small leaflet, and it is easier to augment the, the anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve. So the, the whole principle here is that the, uh, the, the native leaflets become the co-optation point of the tricuspid valve and the new pericardial patch becomes the new uh, leaflet uh, of the tricuspid valve. So typically what happens is uh, we would detach the anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve from commissure to commissure, and then a piece of autologous pericardium is harvested. This is treated in glue traldehyde uh, for 10 minutes and then washed in saline, three cycles of the saline, and then we use, and then we size, we size the patch according to the uh, size of the defect. So we have to choose. Um, um, actually, the patch has to be bigger than the size of the defect, defect because the sutures will take up some space as you place the sutures on the uh, tricuspid, uh, uh, on the pericardial patch. So, and then we can use the valve size, the ring sizes, to help us uh, uh, shape. Or, or size the, the patch. So then we will use 5-0, typically 5-0 cardinal, or you can use 5-0 proline to suture the patch onto the uh, native tricuspid uh, anterior leaflet and then onto the anterior annulus. And then at the end of that, uh, it's still better to place an annuloplasty ring to stabilize the, the repair. Although when you do the water test after a leaflet augmentation, typically you will see no uh, tricuspid regurgitation, but in the long term, it's still better to uh, put a ring to to stabilize the, the tricuspid uh, annulus. So another technique uh, which has been described by um, Elferi um, uh, is the clover technique, and this is a tech. This is another repair technique to address severe tattering of the leaflet as well. Uh, essentially, you suture the three leaflets of the tricuspid valve together uh, 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 and create a, a, what, what looks like a clover. And this technique has been described as well for uh, addressing severely tattered tricuspid valve uh, leaflets. Uh, so this is another patient uh, with severe mitra. This is the, this echo is showing the mitral valve initially. Uh, you can see the tricuspid valve is again severely tattered with no co-optation. Uh, and severe uh, TR as a result. Uh, so in this particular patient, again, I think you can sort of predict already that if you just put an annuloplasty ring, an undersized annuloplasty is not going to work because of the degree of leaflet tattering and, and the severity of the tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, and so in this patient, uh, you could either consider leaflet augmentation in addition to uh, annuloplasty, or uh, it is also reasonable also to consider a, a valve replacement uh, in this in this patient. So there are a few options: uh, annuloplasty plus leaflet augmentation, or the clover technique, 
or a replacement with either a bioprosthetic or a mechanical valve. Uh, and again, the, the same considerations, if you are to decide to replace the valve, the same considerations of tissue versus mechanical valve in terms of durability and the need for warfarin. Now, in the case of the tricuspid valve, most of us, I think, would use a tissue valve rather than the, a mechanical valve because of the concerns of valve thrombosis uh, with a mechanical tricuspid valve uh, in the tricuspid position. Uh, but having said that, there are uh, studies which show that uh, um, the, the, the bioprosthetic valve are not without their problems as either in the tricuspid position. Uh, and so it is better, therefore, to repair the tricuspid valve if possible. But obviously, uh, in some cases, it may not be possible and it may be necessary to repair the, uh, replace the tricuspid valve. Uh, now, uh, in terms of replacing the tricuspid valve, we very rarely have to excise any of the leaflets of the tricuspid valve. Usually, we can implant the tricuspid valve uh, with all the leaflets intact. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, in the septal leaflet, you could actually place the valve switches through the, the leaflet rather than through the annulus to avoid uh, uh, injuring the atrioventricular node. So some years ago, Jill Dreyfus and, uh, and uh, uh, Ernest published this review on to summarize the key concepts of of how we should manage functional TR. So uh, we described three stages. In the first stage where there's only uh, mild annular dilatation and the leaflets are still co-opting normally, there's clearly no need to intervene on the tricuspid valve. But uh, in the second stage where there is tricuspid annular dilatation and uh, some degree of tricuspid regurgitation, then at the time of mitral valve surgery, it would be uh, advisable to uh, intervene on the tricuspid valve. And in these cases, a tricuspid annuloplasty works very well and gives very good results in the long term. Uh, in the third stage where there's severe tethering of the valve leaflets, then uh, some intervention is also needed. Uh, in this case, leaflet, leaflet augmentation should be considered in addition to valve annuloplasty or uh, a tricuspid valve replacement. So this again uh, sums up the uh, the uh, surgery which is needed for the different stages of uh, tricuspid regurgitation, and these are the guidelines with Dr. Yu C. Hoy has uh, uh, already mentioned. Uh, so again, if there is severe primary or secondary TRS, clearly we know that intervention on the tricuspid valve is needed, tricuspid valve repair, but a replacement when repair is not feasible. Uh, if there's moderate sec uh, secondary TR, then if there's annular tricuspid annular dilatation, then uh, tricuspid valve repair is also uh, indicated. So this is a book I I authored. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. If you're interested in this subject, I think uh, um, you could read this. Everything I've mentioned uh, has is uh, put together very nicely in this book, which has contributions from uh, various authors as well on uh, both functional mitra and uh, functional tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, so to end today's, uh, to, to end my presentation, uh, take home message, tricuspid regurgitation has an adverse impact on long-term survival. Uh, severe TR will lead to symptoms and right heart failure Moderate TR will progress if left untreated at the time of mitral or aortic valve surgery, if the tricuspid annulus is dilated, or in the presence of pulmonary hypertension or atrial fibrillation. Concomitant tricuspid valve surgery at the time of left-sided valve surgery does not increase the operative risk. Uh, the operative risk of tricuspid valve surgery after previous left-sided valve surgery is very high when right-sided heart failure is present, uh, so it is better to address the tricuspid valve at the time of the initial left-sided valve surgery when there's greater than mild tricuspid regurgitation and in the presence of tricuspid annular dilatation, raised pulmonary artery pressures or atrial fibrillation. Three stages of functional TR can be defined based on 
TR severity, annular dilatation, leaflet tethering, and leaflet co-optation mode. The type of surgery performed should be tailored according to the stage of the TR. Significant leaflet tethering should be addressed to ensure long-term durability of the tricuspid valve uh, repair. So thank you very much again for joining us and uh, thank you to Edwards for organizing this event. Uh, if you have any questions, I would be uh, very happy to, to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Prof Chan, for that wonderful lecture. I would like to ask if and there are any questions from the part, from the surgeons. Um, if you're going to ask, maybe we could have maybe we could have the surgeons or the participants switch on their mics as well as their videos. Now you can freely do so. And uh, Prof John Chan, you have a couple of questions in the meeting chat already. It's from um, China, uh, from Dr. Lee. He says, how do you choose the size of the ring when the annulus is very large, the ring is relatively small? Is there a risk of dehiscence of the suture? Uh, yeah, yeah, very, very good question. Uh, there is, there's definitely a, a risk of dehiscence of the suture. So, so that, that's why particularly in very large annulus, uh, have to make sure that the, the, the sutures, particularly in the septal angulus, is fairly, uh, uh, fairly deep. And in that, in this patients, in fact, can it even uh, place the, the sutures uh, from the uh, right ventricle side and out to the, 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 the atrial side? So similar to how you do a valve replacement rather than uh, do the tractional plasty uh, sutures so as to have a strong anchoring point uh, where the posterior annulus is you can't place it too deep because of where the right coronary artery would run but then along the anterior annulus you can place the sutures fairly deep as, as well so so uh, particularly in large annulus and you're doing a, a significant reduction uh, you have to be uh, uh, you have to make sure that the sutures are adequately placed through the tricuspid endless to avoid uh, suture dehiscence. But uh, you, you cannot avoid, uh, you, you still have to reduce, even the, the tricuspid endless is very large, you still have to reduce it to the uh, size it needs to be, to, 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 the, to the, the size you have measured uh, to, to get rid of the tricuspid regurgitation. So you still have to do that. Uh, and then you have to be extra careful uh, that your, the sutures are sufficiently deep and that you do not distort the, the right coronary artery. So, so those are a challenge, more challenging group of patients, but uh, uh, and, and more care has to be done, uh, taken during the surgery. Uh, so another question I see from, from India, how to repair rheumatic tricuspid stenosis? Uh, we don't see that many in Malaysia, rheumatic, we, we see, rheumatic tricuspid regurgitation a lot. We don't see that many rheumatic tricuspid stenosis. I guess in India, uh, Dr. Awalawad would, would see more. Uh, and you could you could do the same as you do for the for the mitral valve, some commissurotomy. Uh, and, and if it does not uh, improve, improve it, then tricuspid replacement is, is an option. But uh, we, we don't have that much experience with rheumatic tricuspid stenosis here in Malaysia. Uh, but I think in India, probably you see a lot more of those cases. Okay. Uh, and then another question from Dr. Jain. In functional TR, based on what criteria can we decide that a ring repair is not possible and we'll have to go ahead with valve replacement? Yeah, I think that last example I showed, <laughs> I think in that particular case, I think many surgeons would, would go for a valve replacement rather than uh, suture, uh, uh, rather than an aneuroplasty. Um, you, you can go for aneuroplasty if it doesn't work, go for valve replacement. But I think if you see that degree of leaflet tethering, uh, free TR, non-co-opting leaflets, and particularly if the tricuspid analysis is not dilated, often in those patients, you find that the Tricuspid analysis is actually not that dilated. It may be a bit dilated, but the predominant, predominant problem is leaflet tethering. Uh, and, and those patients typically have rheumatic mitral valve disease. Uh, it, it would be reasonable, I think, in those patients 
uh, to go uh, straight ahead with the valve replacement, uh, or if you are experienced, if you are, if you are very confident in uh, mitral valve repair with doing leaflet augmentation for rheumatic mitral uh, regurgitation or rheumatic mitral stenosis, then I think uh, doing a leaflet augmentation of the tricuspid valve is actually quite do quite not not that difficult. I think most mitral valve repair surgeons uh, will be able to do. Uh, tricuspid leaflet augmentation quite successfully. Uh, and, and you can always try that first. Uh, do a leaflet augmentation first, and if it doesn't work, then you could then uh, go on to uh, replace the tricuspid valve. So I think I think uh, I would recommend definitely attempting to repair the tricuspid valve in the first instance with leaflet augmentation. And if you're unable to, then uh, obviously then you could then replace the tricuspid valve. Um, and then Dr. Fan from China, uh, when you need to place an artificial cord in case of cord rupture, how do you determine the length of the new cord? Uh, so, so this will follow the, the same principles as, uh, as mitral valve repair. Yes, I didn't go into corda, uh, corda repair for tricuspid regurgitation because it's not that common. This will apply more to the degenerative uh, tricuspid regurgitation. For most cases of functional TR, you would not need to place artificial cords to, to replace the tricuspid valve. But if you have got a uh, leaflet prolapse in, in tricuspid regurgitation, is, as you can sometimes, uh, as you sometimes do get, then you can place artificial cords and the same principles would apply. So, so you would just need to adjust the length of the cords so that the all three leaflets would go up at the same, uh, at the same place. So that, there's a bit of judgment in there, but but uh, uh, I think the principle is just to uh, 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 there is techniques of placing the cord. When, when you place the cord, uh, what what you can do is you can run a figure of eight on the tricuspid leaflet, so that uh, you can still adjust the length of the cord uh, um, depending on how much uh, the, depending on the point of cooptation. So 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 place the 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 anchoring switches on the papillary muscle first, and then run a figure of eight on the, uh, or, or just, or not, or, or rather just run it through the leaflet and then run it through again as, as, a, as a loop. And then you can still adjust the, 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 the length um, and, and make sure that the leaflets are all cooperating in the same place. Do a water test. If there's still a, a water leak, then you can still adjust the, the length of the, of the cord before you tie it off. Uh, 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 you, you tie you tie off the you, you tie the knots on the on the core there. Uh, how do you implant the tricuspid ring on a beating heart? Yeah, so I you, you can do that, uh, but I don't find that much of an advantage of, of doing it on the beating heart unless you're doing it on on a reoperation. So uh, so if if you're doing on a on a, a redo. Uh, there are some merits on doing on the beating heart so that you do not have to arrest the heart. Uh, there are some situations where that may be beneficial. But for a first time operation, uh, I, uh, I, I, I find it better to at least place the sutures uh, on the arrested heart uh, and particularly the sutures around the anterior annulus. Uh, around the aortic area, uh, around the, the anterior annulus next to the aortic area. Because uh, if you uh, do it on the beating heart, that that area, uh, the the aorta would have expanded, and and you 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 are at risk of hitting the aortic valve and the aorta in that area. So at least place the sutures uh, uh, along the area first on the arrested heart. Then, if you are concerned about the cross clamp time, or if you are due for a next dose of cardioplegia and you don't want to give more plegia, then you can uh, remove the the cross clamp and place the remaining sutures uh, along the annulus. Uh, there will be a lot of bleeding through the coronary sinus, so you can just put uh, some sucker uh, on the coronary sinus to, to suck out the blood. So doing doing the, uh, I find that placing the sutures, you, you take at most 10 minutes to place all the sutures on the tricuspid annulus. So I don't think uh, additional 10 minutes of cross clamp time would matter that much. And I think it's better to, to place the, the sutures uh, on the arrested heart so that you can place them, uh, you can position them well of adequate depth. And then if you want to, you could then 
remove the cross clamp for you to place the sutures through the annuloplasty ring and then lower the ring and tie the uh, the knots on the beating heart. So, uh, but, but nowadays I just do everything on the arrested heart because I think an additional uh, um, short extra time on cardioplegia does not matter so much. But in a reoperation, uh, then there are, if you're doing a redo, uh, then I think there are uh, cases where it is advantageous to just do everything on the beating heart uh, without the need to, to arrest the heart. Uh, what is your choice of ring for the tricuspid valve repair? Now, nowadays, I just use the, the Physio 2 ring because I find it a very good ring. It's, it's, it's flexible. Initially, I was a bit concerned because the the uh, scepter part of the ring is very short. But then uh, now I realize that the ring, because of the flexibility, is a very nice ring. Uh, and the shorter part of the scepter leaflet gives a gr greater safety area along the uh, along the uh, the conduction part of the scepter annulus. Uh, in the case where where uh, you find that the scepter part may be too short, you can actually extend it a bit onto the anterior uh, annulus. But uh, I think I find most of the time that the Physio 2 ring is a, a very nice ring. The MC3 ring is a very nice ring as well. I mean, that used to be my ring of choice until the Physio 2 came out. Uh, the Physio 2 is a nice bulky ring. Uh, some people don't don't like it because of it's so it's a bit. Uh, Bulky, but I actually like that the the the, the, the MC3 ring. So uh, so I, I think that these two rings are very good. If you ring use these two rings for tricuspid valve repair, I think uh, you will have a very good good outcome from from them. Um, Dr. Lee San, we we always choose a 28 ring for women, a 30 ring for men in tricuspid valve. Uh, what is the prefer difference from your department? So, so this this de depends on the build of your patients. We should actually size the ring because that's the best 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 way to decide the ring size. So now, so nowadays I do size the ring, and uh, I use that to guide the the uh, the size of the, uh, the the ring to for the repair. But in general, in tricuspid valve repair for functional TR, you're following. Uh, the same principles as for mitral valve repair for functional mitral regurgitation. So we are trying to do not a remodeling annuloplasty, but a reduction annuloplasty. So after sizing the ring, uh, you can then downsize it for one or two sizes. So yeah, so I think 28, between a 26 to 28 ring is quite quite uh, normal in, in terms of uh, the size of the ring in the in the in the tricuspid valve, which I would implant now nowadays, but always uh, I will always size the tricuspid ring first before uh, before deciding on the size of the ring. Uh, I hope that's answered everyone everyone's question. Uh, if you, uh, and uh, I hope this has been uh, useful. And uh, uh, if you have any more questions, uh, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for joining the meeting. If we have no more questions for either Prof Yu or Prof John Chan, I think we can um, end the meeting. Thank you so much, Prof Yu, Prof John Chan, for your wonderful lectures. And thank you everyone for participating in the Q&A session. Take care, have a good evening. Bye. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.